clock started to tick. And I'm going through, this may sound impossible, I'm going through many, many decisions in my mind right now. And one decision was, do I, if, if, if I sign this, will I be considered a traitor? The DIR is not just one thing. It's, it's heritage, it's preservation, it's commemoration, it's women's issues. I was inspired by really my opposition to the war and was looking for a way to really uh, try to affect change. This is my painting of the Yankee stadiums while they were still together in the, on location and I was lucky enough to capture the two as one was being destroyed and the other one was going up, one of our great landmarks of the Bronx. Welcome to Study with the Best, the magazine show about CUNY. I'm Tina Beth Pina. Today I'm at the Graduate School of Journalism where students learn how to report the news, but CUNY is full of newsmakers as well. One of the more popular films in recent months is the political thriller Argo, based on a real event. It was directed by and stars Ben Affleck. And while most of the people who saw the film, like myself, liked it, producer Barry Mitchell found one CUNY moviegoer who wishes the film had never been made. I'm Barry Mitchell. The movie Argo was directed by and stars Ben Affleck. Based on the 1979 Iran hostage crisis, it's been garnering rave reviews. The problem with the film is that it's too casual. It was made funny. Never had any relevance to the real Iran hostage crisis. Meet Barry Rosen, Brooklyn College alumnus and executive director of public and external affairs at CUNY's Borough of Manhattan Community College. Why is he uniquely qualified to comment on Argo? I'm qualified to give this review because I was one of the hostages taken in 1979. One of the 52 American hostages. From 1979 to 1981, the Iran hostage crisis dominated the headlines. For most Americans, the Ayatollah Khomeini, leader of the Islamist Iranian Revolution, was evil incarnate. The hostage crisis began November 4, 1979, when militant Iranian students stormed the U.S. Embassy in Tehran, protesting the United States' failure to hand over their deposed monarch, the Shah of Iran, for trial. These students were what I would call part-time students. They were ideologically motivated for revolution and less motivated uh, to go to school. What were you doing in Iran in 1979? It all started as a Peace Corps volunteer in 1967, 1969. 1979, I was the U.S. press attaché to uh, the embassy in Iran. And that meant that my wife had to stay back home and my kids had to stay back home. The six embassy employees portrayed in Argo had their own harrowing experience. But they managed to flee the American embassy during the early moments of the takeover and hide out with the Canadian ambassador until they were smuggled out of the country. As opposed to me, I was kept for full 444 days under blindfolds, mock executions. We were always threatened for our life all the time. Rosen's captors wanted him to sign a document saying he was spying for the United States. So there I am in this place. I'm blindfolded. I'm walked down a staircase, marble staircase, and I'm led into this wild scene of six Iranians in black uniforms, automatic weapons in their hand. They shoved me into a seat, and I was facing this this other person who was in a black hood, and he said to me, sign this, in Farsi, sign this, I'll give you 10 seconds, if you don't sign it, I'm going to shoot you. So, there I am, 10, 9. And you believed him? Absolutely, and the clock started to tick. And I'm going through, this may sound impossible, I'm going through many, many decisions in my mind right now. And one decision was, do I, if, if, if I sign this, will I be considered a traitor? And the other thing is, I have a family, I want to live. So as we got to nearly three or two or one, I said, okay, I'll sign it. I signed it and I was very, very depressed about signing it. I just felt that I was not being loyal to my country. To this day, Rosen suffers the ill effects of his captivity 34 years ago. 
but I have mental trauma that comes out in a physical form. I do have PTSD, I have high anxiety, and lately, in the last three, four months, panic attacks. By the fall of 1980, Iran had gone to war with Iraq. For Iran, the hostages were now a liability. So after 444 days in captivity, Barry Rosen and the others were heading home. We were no longer a piece of goods that was really good for Iran. We were actually a piece of goods that they wanted to get rid of. Believe me, when they spat on us as we left the bus to get onto Algiers air, leaving Iran, I was still frightened that I would die at any moment. For me, um, the person who was taken in 1979 is not the same person. I can observe what went on in 1979 as a scholar of what went on. Maybe that's a way of coping. I think it is a way of coping. I'm very much invested in Iranian history. And that's why in 1998, 17 years after his release, Barry Rosen, his wife and daughter, met face to face with one of his captors in a meeting arranged by UNICEF and an American human rights organization. This time he stayed in a hotel. In 1998, I met with Abbas Abdi, who was actually the chief strategist of the takeover of the, of the US Embassy. I met him in, in Paris in uh, 1998, uh, attempting to work, talk to him about um, improving U.S.-Iran relations. In fact, um, Abdi did say to me that he apologized, and he apologized to, to my wife and my daughter. He wasn't uh, regretful at all about taking hostages, but he was regretful that he had made life miserable for my, my family. One funny thing that I thought happened during this meeting was to show how the Iranians feel about the life they're living in. Several of his comrades, who were doctors, musicians, his friends, came along too. So we went off to see Versailles on a trip. And two of these people said to me, you know, it's good to be a king. It's, it's good, good to be? Good to be a king. Yeah. Living this high life, not bad. Several of Abdi's comrades would come into my room and ask me, how do I mix drinks? <laughs> they had a, a refrigerator full of drinks, but they wanted to know how to mix them. You need to pitch this to Ben <laughs> Affleck <laughs> for the sequel to Argo. You're a fascinating guy with a very interesting story. CUNY's own Barry Rosen, thanks so much for talking with you're us. You're welcome. And you're watching Study With The Best. Who would have thought it? From the scars of exclusion comes the power of inclusion, a story in miniature that chronicles where we are now, as a country and as a people. And we're talking about the DAR, also known as the Daughters of the American Revolution. The DAR is not just one thing. It's, it's heritage, it's preservation, it's commemoration, it's women's issues. The DAR was founded in 1890 for women whose ancestors were patriots in the Revolutionary War. Even though the first person killed in the Revolutionary War was black, and over 5,000 African Americans contributed to America's fight for independence, the DAR excluded women of color for many years. It made headlines most notably when the acclaimed African American contralto, Marian Anderson, was denied the right to perform at Constitution Hall by the DAR because of her color. Instead, and at the urging of Eleanor Roosevelt, who quit the DAR in protest, the singer performed at the Lincoln Memorial on April 9, 1939. how badly Marian Anderson was treated and I felt that I didn't want to align myself with such an organization. I worked for civil rights when I was growing up 
and uh, so later on, <laughs> things have changed, and as we say, it's not your mother's DAR. No, this is not your mother's DAR anymore. It has changed over the years to welcome women of all races, religions, and ethnic backgrounds. So when the DAR hit the headlines again this summer, it was a very, very different story. For the first time, a woman of color was selected to be the president of a new DAR chapter. When they picked up the story in the New York Times, that was just, just completely unexpected. Did not even give it a thought. They called me, asked me about starting the chapter, that's fine. And then on the 4th of July on the front page, they uh, felt that it was an important milestone in the history of DAR. As Wilhelmina Rhodes Kelly sees it, today's DAR is all about history and patriotism, pure and simple. And that includes everybody. Well, I descend from a patriot of the Revolutionary War, Stephen H. Hamlin, who was not necessarily a soldier. He actually provided uh, a rifle and a horse and beef for the soldiers. He was white. He was European. It was his grandson, Edward Hamlin, who the family calls Ned, who had a committed relationship with a formerly enslaved woman, Dolly Scott, and they uh, had children together both before and after the Civil War. I'm also interested in this particular chapter because it's named after a relative of mine whose name is Increase Carpenter. And Increase Carpenter was a tavern owner in Queens during the Revolution and a patriot. And because of his patriotism, which was not very popular with the British, uh, he was executed. And he is buried here. It's on the campus of York College. Through genealogy, I have found that uh, there has been a member of my family that has served in every war that America has ever fought in, going back to the French and Indian War. So before the Revolution, it's an honor to know that uh, my family has contributed to the growth of what we now know as America. The big picture of this chapter, the Increased Carpenter chapter, is that we're, we're not old-fashioned. We're not sitting with funny hats having tea. We don't just stay at home. We reach out. We reach out to the Lawrence Cemetery. Uh, we reach out to the veterans. We reach out to the wounded in the hospital. We're interested in historic preservation. There's a lot going on here. Thank you. Now you are welcome, my Official. We try to help people find their identity, find their foundation, share it with their children, and give them a sense of self. Uh, you must know uh, where you've come from in order to really appreciate who you are and what your strengths are and what people have gone through. Uh, to uh, make it possible for you to live in this country that has so much and has uh, potential for even more greatness. Just as a footnote, the historic Marian Anderson concert at the Lincoln Memorial sparked a change in the DAR, and they welcomed the opera singer to Constitution Hall for a benefit concert for war relief in 1943 and for many occasions after that. That same year, Hunter in the Bronx, now Lehman College, played a vital role in the World War II effort. Let's take a look. Great moments in CUNY history. In 1943, Hunter in the Bronx, now known as Lehman College, pledged allegiance to the United States war effort by becoming a nerve center for women in World War II. The U.S. Navy used this campus as a staging area for its WAVES organization, the Women Accepted for Volunteer Emergency Service. Close to 86,000 women were recruited and trained for volunteer service on the campus. Women were trained as mechanics, instrument trainers, navigators, parachute riggers, and decoders of Japanese secret messages. The Lehman College campus was virtually taken over by the training program. Lehman College was awarded a place in world history by the United Nations for its role of training women in the war. As a token of appreciation for its war effort, the Navy installed a ship's bell from the USS Columbia on the campus, and even today, the bell and a wave stained glass window remain.
My name is Jonathan Moore. I'm a partner at the law firm of Bell, Dock, Levine, and Hoffman, and I'm presently on the uh, adjunct faculty at uh, CUNY Law School, where I teach a, a course in government misconduct and civil rights. I came of age during the Vietnam War. I graduated from college in 1970. I was inspired by really my opposition to the war and was looking for a way to really try to affect change. So it seemed the way to do that was to go to law school. First uh, case I ever worked on, actually, in the civil rights context, was a, a matter involving the, uh, the murder of Fred Hampton and Mark Clark, who were Black Panther Party members in Illinois back in the 60s, who were targeted for uh, disruption and harassment by the FBI. That kind of work, that kind of really critical, important work, really inspired me, and I've been doing that work ever since. I've been teaching a course on government misconduct at, uh, at CUNY Law School. What makes the class very powerful is that you, you look at current events, it's not just like this historical look. There is that, but it's also what's going on now and how is it evolving, because civil rights law is one of those areas of law that is constantly evolving. So in the last class that I taught, there was an incident involving a fellow in Florida called Trayvon Martin, who was unfortunately killed at the hands of uh, somebody who was a uh, neighborhood watch person. There are issues of race there, complicated issues of race, because the alleged perpetrator of that crime is uh, Hispanic in part, so it's not so black and white, as they say. But you take that current kind of context and you, and you, you uh, pose the question to the class, is there a civil rights violation there? There's no case that has moved me in terms of the, the need for, real, for justice to be uh, done and for the, the truth to come out as a Central Park Trial case. This is a case that has a very is very current in the city right now because of, of uh, a lot of publicity about it. There's a, a documentary that's out about it that's getting a lot of attention. It's a case that involves five young men who were uh, as we now know, wrongfully accused of a vicious, horrendous crime. My role as a teacher at CUNY is it's important to teach everybody that they have to respect the law, that they have to take seriously their oath to uphold the Constitution. I started to look a few years ago at trying to get into cases that had, uh, I, where I would have more opportunity to affect systemic change. For instance, one of the cases that we're presently doing and have been doing in this office since 1999 involves the question of whether the, the New York City Police Department engages in uh, unlawful stops and frisks of African American and Latino youth in the city. Our interest in that was to try to not just bring a measure of uh, uh, justice to the individual plaintiffs, but to look use that case as a vehicle to try to change a policy. Part of what we, um, we try to do in the practice of being a civil rights lawyer is to really focus on whether there's violations of rights, regardless of who, who the victim is. The victim is not necessarily the kid on the street who's wearing a hoodie and the cops decide that he looks suspicious and they engage him and something happens and he gets hurt or he gets killed, uh, which happens all too frequently. But the victims could be the police themselves. I feel like you, we can make a difference, that we can actually uh, change the way uh, institutions, the way they do their job. And we can not just deal with one person's unfortunate encounter or experience, but we, we can really get some systemic change. Poet and humorist Ogden Nash once said, the Bronx no thanks. People's conception of the Bronx should change, and I hope to be a part of that catalyst for making that change. Welcome to my studio. My name is Danny Haubin, and I've been painting scenes of the Bronx for a good chunk of my life, 30 years. These are examples of pop-up paintings I've been doing. This is Marble Hill in the Bronx, and these are pastels, which lend themselves to the spontaneity and quick work of uh, being in a location with 
so many things going on. This is the uh, Riverdale River Fest, and while everybody's going about their business, I'm painting, and at the end of the day, I have this uh, colorful rendition of the day's activities. <laughs> I teach architecture at City College, and at one time I taught uh, drawing at the Graduate Center. I just finished a 22 painting commission for Bronx Community College, new library uh, that's called the North Hall and Library. This has been a great honor for me to have been chosen for this project. This was a $80 million building. It's not just utilitarian, it's inspiring. Coming up the two stairwells on the far wall of either one, you find my uh, view of the Harlem River or the view from the Hall of Fame. And you come out and you come into the main entrance way to the Information Commons, which is the main reading room, which is surrounded by the balcony that has the rest of my paintings. Uh, there are 20 paintings that surround the main reading room. My objective was to make iconic images that even from that distance would register as a familiar kind of a uh, view. This is my painting of the Yankee Stadiums while they were still together in the, on location and I was lucky enough to capture the two as one was being destroyed and the other one was going up, one of our great landmarks of the Bronx. I believe the timing of this commission has been fantastic because we are experiencing a renewal of, uh, of cultural activity in the Bronx the likes of which I did not feel for, for several decades. The period of the burning Bronx in the, from the late 60s to the early 80s generated negative press and, and negative coverage. I took the number four train going through, you know, block after block of, of burnt out buildings. That powerful image inspired my work for many years. I feel like we're at a moment where we're emerging. There is this kind of momentum. There is an attempt on the part of many people from many directions trying to make a, a viable uh, life in the Bronx. My work is about people going about their daily lives trying to uh, have the best life they can under the circumstances. It's a wonderful feeling to know that your work will be uh, enjoyed by generations to come. Thanks for watching Study with the Best. For all things CUNY, log into our website at cuny.edu or you can Facebook and tweet us at CUNY TV. See you next time. This is a uh... Uh, my friend Dave Rader, who I spent two months with in a black hole, as we called it, and we had nothing to read except the boat section of the Washington Post, since it was totally apolitical, and we would imagine sailing on the Chesapeake together. And we, both of us, became so close together, we were like brothers. We knew each other's lives inside and out, and this has lasted for 33 years, this friendship with this man. Lieutenant Colonel Dave Rader. This was made by uh, a group in the United States. And as we got on, uh, on board to go to East Baden, we all had one of these on our jackets. President Reagan said to us, I want you back to work in two weeks. It seemed like a little bit weird to me at that time. I, um, it was a little bit officious, I thought, on his side. Let me see if I can find something else. That was like getting back on the horse. Yeah, well, I didn't particularly want to get back on the horse at that time.